Hey, GW coming to you live. We are going to talk about a 1979 horror anthology film called Screams of a Winter Night. Now, a couple things about this movie. One, it it didn't get much fanfare whenever it uh, it debuted. It was pretty much dismissed. It's streaming now on Shudder. If you guys have that, you can check it out now. The audience for this film is going to be divided because it is a slow film until it gets to the stories. The stories that are told and shown in this film are the highlights of the film. And it is interesting to note that the cast of the film also play, they do everything. So the cast in the cabin, the first people you see, the six people you see, are the same people that are in the stories. So it's kind of neat. In that respect, that the cast does everything. They play every role. Um, hmm. Believe it or not, this was a Full Moon Pictures release. And you'd never know it. Because it lacks the... The goofy puppets, killer marionettes, and everything else Full Moon churns out, you know. And it's interesting to note, too, that looking at the cover and looking at the people, uh, this was not done by Charles Band. Charles Band directs mostly everything in the Full Moon catalog. You know, he does everything. But this is not, you know, not your typical Charles Band movie. It was directed by a guy named James L. Wilson, which is interesting to note. But let's talk about the film. The film is about a group of people that stay in a cabin with a seemingly haunted, I don't want to say past, but, well, yeah, I guess you could say past. And they end up telling scary stories and trying to make out in between the scary stories. The stories themselves, like I just mentioned, are the highlight of the film. The first film focuses on a creature in the woods <clears throat> that terrorizes a couple driving. It's interesting. It, it, the, the funny thing about that story is that it's not that long. The second story comes a little bit later, focuses on kids trying to join a fraternity. Three kids have to stay in an abandoned building, you guys know the story, and are not allowed up through the first floor, they're only allowed to have a flashlight, and it's probably, to me, it's probably not the strongest story in the anthology, but it's interesting because at the end it has a zombie-like creature. The third story is one of my favorites. And having just watched the film just once, I can tell you that it's by far probably the most creative. It's about a girl who was buried in a outside of a cemetery because the people in the village that the story takes place in obviously do not like her there so they put her in the village so these kids come around and they're looking for things inside you know graves and they're scavenging and the spirit terrorizes them not the most intense story on on the on the film but probably the most creative in terms of setting the cemetery looks creepy um the creature for the five or ten minutes the story goes on the creature the girl looks like a raving mad jawa which i thought was pretty neat and it was one of those ones that you could pretty much flesh out and make it make into a tv show so interesting to note the the wraparound story in this whole thing is that there is a spirit that 
is a part of a curse on the on the ground that this cabin is that they're staying in. Now the end of the film pretty much is where all your special effects are. You know, wind can be frightening. Wind, stormy nights, you know, they can all be part of something if you use them elements correctly. The end of the film does that. And just like Burial Ground, this film just sort of stops and you see some of the survivors, you see the carnage after the fact. For a PG-13, this thing does have a pretty moderate body count, actually. Uh, you have an impalement on a cemetery gate. You have a hanging. You have a stabbing. And also with that stabbing, you have an attempted rape, which was pretty pretty intense for a PG at that time. Um, you have uh, death by glass. You have death by crushed chair or uh, crush, crushing because of a, a lamp. You know, so it's it's pretty intense for a PG, but also this was 1979. This was the year that you know, five years earlier, we saw, you know, Jaws, and we saw how intense that movie can be for a PG. And to this day, this is still one of, that was still one of the strongest, more violent PG-13 films there. And I think the reason why is, again, because they did not have the PG-13 in place. That didn't come till 1984 with Red Dawn. I think that's why they were able to get away with some of the intense stuff for this. Now, as I said, you know, the stories are the highlight of this. Watching the people scare each other, make out, and, you know, act like idiots toward each other. It's fun, but it sort of grows stale as the film drags. Because this film is not an hour and 34 minutes. This film is also almost an hour and 58 minutes. So... You know, it, it does drag in places, and that's not a bad thing. It uses it to build up characters. The more they sit around and yik-yak, aside from telling stories, the more you get to know them. This film is not a bad film. It's just slow in parts, and I think that's why people quickly dismiss it. Screams of a Winter Night, it's put out by Code Red. You can buy it on Amazon, or if you have Shudder, you can definitely check it out there. Very surprising. Very surprising. I really thought it was going to be dumber than, or not as good as, as what it was, and especially now that I just found out it's a full moon picture. Those are notoriously um, labeled as, you know, B-movies, at their very worst. Between Full Moon and Troma. Troma is actually a step up. Depending on how you look at it. But. Screams of a Winter Night is actually surprising. Um, now I did watch. If you do guys get the Blu-ray. There's two versions of the film. There's the theatrical cut. Which I would imagine is a shorter cut. And then you have. The. Uh, hard to find. But we found it cut. The director's edition cut. And, or the thought to be long lost cut, I should say. That's the one that I just watched. And you can tell there's inserts and cuts because it is filmed actually on 16 millimeter, the AB roll, the old time film projectors, which definitely adds to me. I, I love the way that movies like that are filmed because it gives you a sense that the temperature is cold the grainy look of the film is just to me I, I love that look and i love the fact that you know this this for pg-13 does push or pg does push boundaries and like i said give it a whirl a lot of people i guess have caught this thing on tv once or twice and i've read reviews where hey you know i'm glad that shutter has this it took me back to whenever i was you know, young, and I, I was getting into horror films and this and that. Um, the one criticism that I will say about this movie is they talk about the wind demon. 
I don't know exactly his name. I want to say Chautauqua, but that's not it. But they, they mention it in the film. That is never shown. And I think this film was filmed on a very, very small budget. I mean, all you would really need to do is shoot the cabin sequences. You would need to shoot the cemetery. You know, nothing that was high budget at that point. And I think that they used all their money on the last sequences where the cabin gets destroyed. Also, at the very end of this, and I know I mentioned this and I complained about this on the Firestarter movie, there was CGI fire at the end of this. And I think that's where most of their money had did go. But they didn't show the wind monster. Which, if they did, they could have had it like as a parting shot. As the survivors run away. Um, but surprisingly this movie is very entertaining. If you go into it. And just look for a very. Or a good anthology horror picture. But like I said. It's going to turn people off. Because it does. The pacing of it at some points is slow. But when the stories are told. That's when you pay attention. But this is a film too. Where the whole cast. You know, um, Matt Borrell, Gil Glasgow, Brandy Barrett, Jan Norton, and Charles Ricker. They play every single character in this film. The main characters who are at the cabin, and also the characters that are featured in the story. So, they do a lot, guys. They do a lot of stuff. And the script on this had to be enormous. So, it's kind of cool to see them do everything. Um, and I, I can say, you know, like I said, I was thoroughly entertained. At parts, I did think I was going to fall asleep. But, honestly, you got to watch it for character development. you got to see the characters. The stories are pretty cool. They're a take on the old school, you know, stories, horror stories, everybody's heard type deal. But with a modern twist. There's also a story, too, about, and I just remembered it because it was right after the story about the girl that I told you in the cemetery. Um, it's called, the I, I call it The Girl Next Door. I don't know what the title is. You know, you should watch that one. It's completely wicked, bloody. But anyway, Screams of a Winter Night playing on Shudder. I give it three out of five stars. I say give it a whirl. So, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, a review of a movie, an alien invasion movie starring Kevin Peter Hall, who, if you guys don't know him, he played the Predator in Predator 1, Predator 2, and I think Predators. But uh, it stars Jack Palance, and should be a good one. So we'll review that film tomorrow.